Um, David Leitner uh, is a cinematographer and uh, did this cinematography on a movie that you guys are going to see tomorrow night if you're lucky uh, and get back here, a Wendy Keys film on uh, Milton Glaser, To Inform and Delight. Did the cinematography on that and I'm sure several other pictures. I'm just aware of that one because I've seen it. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what happened in this film. You, have you seen this a, a lot of times before or just now? This is the first time I've seen it. Um, yeah. Richard Barnes is a friend of mine. Okay. In fact, um, Richard is just finishing a, up a project at the Glass House in New Canaan. He's been photographing uh, Philip Johnson's architectural uh, icon. Uh, the pretext is that there's an, a fog sculpture that's been in place all summer by a Japanese fog artist. Richard's uh, photographs will be compiled in a book that'll be out in the spring. And on Monday, I'm starting a film there. I'm shooting the same thing in digital video uh -huh. with five cameras and a, and a big setup to try to capture my version of the same thing. Okay. So in a funny, weird, weird way, there's uh, an organic connection between me a little bit and this film. Well, and, and that's the interesting thing to me about this film is the, the sort of organic connection of, of the people who make the lenses and their relationship with photography and the people that use the lenses and their relationship to the lenses themselves and the people who make them. Um, it very, it's established early on that uh, the uh, Egyptian photographer is saying, if she's asked these questions, that how important photography is to her, it's essentially everything to her. It's about the meaning of her life, it's what her commitment is, it's, and at the end she says she can't even imagine a life without a camera, and yet she never thinks about the lenses or who makes them. You know, she thinks about the quality of the lenses and what lenses she wants to use. Of course, those are important things, but she's not thinking about it. She says it's like the apple and the farmer. You eat an apple, you don't necessarily think about the person that grew the apple. Uh, you may or you may not, and now that there's this farm-to-table movement, maybe we'll think about it more, but um, it's very fascinating that people make, spend their lives making these lenses and never see them in use. I mean, the woman who saw the, the camera lens, the motion picture lens being used to film her and this is the first time she's ever seen one actually in use. And she's asked about her relationship to photography and she shows us her cat's photos. But then it's a very spiritual connection because it's a, it's a cat photo that, that goes to her father's spirit and he's providing the water for the cat and the, the hat is on the table with his, her father's watch, I guess, as well. And, and, the, and then it gets meta on top of it because we're all watching the filming of this relationship between cameras and lenses and, um, and people, how they react to it, how they make their art, how it the, gives the meaning to their lives, and then the science of it, to a certain degree, the science of it. So um, for you, if, this, if you were on film for this, for this movie, what would you say about your relationship to your lenses and your understanding of, of the way those, those work and how they inform the way, the way that you do your work? The film, to me, is a little um, it raises a lot of issues beyond the scope of this conversation. Um, for one thing, all the lenses were Canon lenses. You may have noticed that. Um, we live in a universe. I'm very close to the people that own Cook in, in the UK. UK was never mentioned, um, and they're almost as old as Zeiss and Jena in, in East Germany. Um, the Japanese lens industry came about as a result of the Second World War, the Axis collaboration. There's a whole history behind all of this stuff. It, there are many manufacturers of lenses, the French, Ingenue, etc. So it's a much wider topic. Um, uh, I thought the focus of the film was a bit narrow. And that's okay, that's okay. I mean, everyone had something interesting to say. I, I walked in uh, just after the first film had begun. And the first film, rather rueful, um, made by a millennial, which was kind of interesting. You know, to her, Stan Brackage is, is this ancient person. And, um, you know, I'm from that era. I started out in motion picture film. In fact, there was very little 35 millimeter because all she knows how to do is to shoot a 16 millimeter Bolex. That's fine. I'm just saying. Um, I was uh, technical director at Duart Film Laboratory uh, in New York City uh, for, uh, from the late 70s to the mid 80s. Duart's the oldest continuously operating motion picture lab in the US. Uh, they stopped processing film maybe three years ago. I was there the day the button was turned off. They'd been developing film for like 70 years, something like that. Um, I'm very close to a lot of these topics. 
Uh, I was also one of the first people who uh, transitioned to digital. In fact, I directed one of the first features uh, shot in HD. It was Patrick Wilson's first film, if you know who he is. Um, I, I'm a director as well as a DP. And I've been close to these issues my whole life. I started out, as Richard, Richard mentioned, you know, he wished he'd studied theory and history more, but that's where I started. So I kind of backed backwards into the industry, trying to figure out where I fit. And I, I wandered for many years. I, I ran a lens testing facility, believe it or not. I've got an optics background in New York City. I, was, I had the first lens test projector in New York back in the early 80s, and I kind of blew open that, that world because prior to that, lenses were intentionally mysterious. You know, you'd go to a rental house, for instance, in the motion picture business and rent a lens. Well, there might be five of those lenses on the shelf. Which one was the best? Well, they're all equally as good. Well, let me test them. No, you can't. And if they allowed you to test them, you'd have to go out and shoot film tests. You'd have to expose the film using all five lenses on the same camera, cut, of course, process the film, print the film, put all the five clips in a projector, and you know, a week and a half has passed. Of course, you have to pay a crew to do this. You had an assistant that would help you do this. A lot of time is wasted. And then you're looking very carefully at the screen, and the projector's not quite perfectly focused, and you're not sure which of the lenses is best. Very, very difficult. The lens test projector just allowed you to put a lens on a projector. It looked like a slide projector. You could project it onto a screen like this and you'd know in two seconds what that lens was doing. Was it losing focus as it went through its zoom? What were its flare characteristics? What kind of distortion did it add? Which aberrations were present or evident at which f-stops and things like that. So, you know, the discussion, now I'm trying to get back into the, dis the question you asked me. The discussion of lenses is very complex. Um, there are historical um, issues. There, uh, I'll give you, if I may, I, I know I cut myself off and segue a, a little <laughs> fast, but just fought, go with me because I'm going someplace. Many years ago, Eastman Kodak, every couple of years, would come out with a new film. And they'd always say, this new motion picture film stock is much more colorful and true to life and much sharper than what came before. And then a few years later, they'd come out with another one. It's much truer to life, much better colors. And I would always say, well, what was the last one? Chopped liver? You know, what does that mean? to have better colors to, or to have a sharper image. What does any of that mean? In the graphic arts, we use texture. Sometimes texture means gritty. Sometimes it means coarse. Sometimes it means soft. Sometimes it means hard. It can be sharp. It can be diffuse. So when you start getting and really thinking about the aesthetic issues of lenses, maybe a Petzval lens from the 19th century is what you want to use. In fact, they're being manufactured again because their flaws are so artistic. You, know, you get these fabulous background, out of focus zones that, that make any photographer seem very artistic. Um, it, I, I got a kick out of Richard Barnes uh, with that wet plate photography he was doing at the Confederate, uh, those idiots that go out and refight the Civil Re War. Reenactors. Yeah, exactly, because you'd see like power lines, or one guy I think had a GoPro camera. I don't know what that was, but it was hysterical. No, I saw those things too. They're great. Yeah, and, and to me, there's, 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 um, he's, a, he's a true uh, craftsperson and an artisan. I'm not sure that all people are. See, I have biases. For one thing... <laughs> really? For one thing, photographers that Imagine use... Imagine that. Photographers that use uh, sh cameras that have, can take many photographs very quickly, and then they seize that one photograph and they hold it up and they say, this is brilliant. And then the world acclaims them, your photography is brilliant. You know, I, I mean, I shoot 24 frames a second, or 30 frames, or 60 frames, or whatever I'm doing. When you're shooting with a, with a, with a motor drive on a camera like that, you know, I, I mean, you do have to know what you're doing, but you're getting a lot of assistance from the technology. The people that get out there and use their own sense of the moment, you know, that moment where they click the shutter, and they capture that, like, kid going over the puddle, or whatever it is, those are the people that interest me a little bit more. Um, I, I can't explain this, but I, 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 it's a push-pull. I'm attracted to technology. I use it every day. I was up till 3 in the morning color correcting. It's now called grading. Uh, 4K digital images, motion picture. Uh, time, does that mean I have to shut up? <laughs> it means we, we're okay. running out of time. But. Um, 
I couldn't have been doing this uh, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you would be using a person in the laboratory that did that professionally. But now I can control it all myself. And like Stephen Goldblatt, I don't have to have a giant printer and print out single frames. So technology is my friend. I'm attracted to it. At the same time, technology, as we all understand, can have an alienating effect. And in the case of this art form, photography, which is predicated on technology, you have no photography without technology. It's not like taking a, a pen or a watercolor and applying it to paper. Without, you know, me mechanisms and, and circuits and, and glass lenses, you have no photography. Well, what I'm trying to say is that the, 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 so many layers of technology have now been added in. Yes, they help us do things, but they push us away from that direct relationship with the tool and with our own talent. And it's, it's, it, you could say it's a creative tension that we all deal with, but we all deal with it all the time. So when I said at the very outset that I had a complicated reaction, <laughs> it's, it's based on everything I just said watching this. There were so many issues flying around up here, and they, I, frankly, I don't think many of them were really articulated very well. Well, I, I, well there you go. Um, and to that, as a rebuttal, all I would say is that I, I felt that it was effective in raising the questions. The answers that were given are not necessarily the end result that I think maybe he's going for, I'm not sure, but I think it there to make us think about what are these relationships. And there were several, to me, very salient truths captured by this, which was, going back to what you said, that yes, the technology is advanced, and the sports photographer, I'm not gonna remember everybody's name, but the sports, sports illustrated photographer was saying, um, look, I'm, I'm glad that everybody's taking pictures. My experience will make mine stand out. I hope they will. And the, the advances in technology enable me to get things that I would be unable to get. And my experience enables me to do it better than anybody else using the same technology. But also goes the fact of what several of the people said, which was that the artistry is in having the eye. You can't develop the eye. You can't give someone an eye. You can maybe bring that talent to the fore. And someone may see a moment and capture that moment without a motor drive, without any of the advances in technology, but the ability to see that thing that the Egyptian photographer saw, some of the other artistic photographers saw, then capture that one moment that we all go by and we don't see the beauty of it until it's captured for us by an artist. And so the relationship between art and technology is I think explored here. It's not answered, and it is a narrow focus. It, it, you're going to pick one camera lens. If, it, otherwise, it's a different film. If you say every lens company that makes lenses, you should talk to all of them about how they make their lenses and how they feel about it. It's, it's, without being narrow, it, it gets too broad, I think. So, but to, your, to, my, to your point and my point, I think you should have been on this film because clearly you have a pretty good idea of how your relationship is between the lenses and the technology and the art form. So I, th I thank you very much for coming out. You're welcome. Um, maybe we have a question or two. Do we have time? Do we have time for a question? No, no time for questions. I'm told we have no time for questions. I'm really sorry to hear that. But I'll stick around if you want. Yeah, go ahead.